Hi sweeties! If this is your first time joining me, hi, how are you? I'm Dee, it's nice to meet you. And if you're returning, welcome back! Either way, thank you so much for choosing to spend some time with me. So today, uh, I'm doing some soft speaking. I've never done it before, but uh, I don't really feel like whispering right now, so I thought it would be a good time to try it out. And I guess kind of back by popular demand, we're gonna read more of the Song of Achilles. Uh, I got a few comments on the first video I did, reading the first three chapters, and people seemed like they were enjoying it, and then uh, I did another one where I read chapters four and five and then didn't continue. Um, but then, when I posted my last video, the book haul, uh, someone commented and asked me if I would keep going. And their name was just the letter D, so from one D to another. Thank you, I'm glad you were enjoying it, and I'm happy to continue. As a lot of you know, this is my favorite book, um, so, you know, I'm happy to read it again. Um, so I'll read chapters six and seven for sure and see where that leaves us time-wise. Um, and if I feel like it can be a little longer, then I will read chapter eight as well. Um, but yeah, if you hear any like construction sounds in the background, I do apologize. They're doing, they're building another apartment building next to my apartment complex. Um, so yeah. And then I also have a little mug that says, let's be friends. <laughs> um, there's just some cold water in here to keep my throat lubricated. And <laughs> any word would be bad. So let's get started. I'm so excited. These are some of my favorite chapters, I think, also, so... Woohoo! All right. Chapter 6. Our friendship came all at once after that, like spring floods from the mountains. Before, the boys and I had imagined that his days were filled with princely instruction, statecraft, and spear. But I had long since learned the truth. Other than his liar lessons and his drills, he had no instruction. One day we might go swimming, another we might climb trees. We made up games for ourselves of racing and tumbling. We would lie on the warm sand and say, guess what I'm thinking about? The falcon we had seen from our window, the boy with the crooked front tooth, dinner. And as we swam or played or talked, a feeling would come. It was almost like fear in the way it filled me, rising in my chest. It was almost like tears and how swiftly it came. But it was neither of those. Buoyant where they were heavy, bright where they were dull. I had known contentment before, brief snatches of time in which I pursued solitary pleasure, skipping stones or dicing or dreaming. But in truth, it had been less a presence than an absence, a laying aside of dread. My father was not near, nor boys. I was not hungry or tired or sick. This feeling was different. I found myself grinning until my cheeks hurt, my scalp prickling till I thought it might lift off my head. My tongue ran away from me, giddy with freedom. This and this and this, I said to him. I did not have to fear that I spoke too much. I did not have to worry that I was too slender or too slow. This and this and this. I taught him how to skip stones and he taught me how to carve wood. I could feel every nerve in my body, every brush of air against my skin. He played my mother's lyre, and I watched. When it was my turn to play, my fingers tangled in the strings and the teacher despaired of me. I did not care. Play again, I told him, and he played until I could barely see his fingers in the dark. I saw then how I had changed. I did not mind any more that I lost when we raced, and I lost when we swam out to the rocks, and I lost when we tossed spears or skipped stones. For who can be ashamed to lose to such beauty? It was enough to watch him win, 
to see the soles of his feet flashing as they kicked up sand, or the rise and fall of his shoulders as he pulled through the salt. It was enough. It was late summer, over a year after my exile had begun, when I at last told him of how I had killed the boy. We were in the branches of the courtyard oak, hidden by patchwork leaves. It was easier here somehow, off the ground, with the solid trunk at my back. He listened silently, and when I had finished, he asked, Why did you not say that you were defending yourself? It was like him to ask this, the thing that I had not thought of before. I don't know. Or you could have lied, said you found him already dead. I stared at him, stunned by the simplicity of it. I could have lied. And then, the revelation that followed. If I had lied, I would still be a prince. It was not murder that had exiled me. It was my lack of cunning. I understood now the disgust in my father's eyes. His moron son confessing all. I recalled how his jaw had hardened as I spoke. He does not deserve to be a king. You would not have lied, I said. No, he admitted. What would you have done? I asked. Achilles tapped a finger against the branch he sat on. I don't know. I can't imagine it, the way the boy spoke to you. He shrugged. No one has ever tried to take something from me. Never? I could not believe it. A life without such things seemed impossible. Never. He was silent a moment, thinking. I don't know, he repeated finally. I think I would be angry. He closed his eyes and rested his head back against a branch. The green oak leaves crowded his hair like a crown. I saw King Peleus often now. We were called to council sometimes and dinners with visiting kings. I was allowed to sit at the table beside Achilles, even to speak if I wished. I did not wish. I was happy to be silent and watch the men around me. Scops, Peleus took to calling me. Owl for my big eyes. He was good at this sort of affection, general and unbinding. After the men were gone, we would sit with him by the fire to hear the stories of his youth. The old man, now gray and faded, told us, told us that he had once fought beside Heracles. When I said that I had seen Philoctetes, he smiled. Yes, the bearer of Heracles' great bow. Back then he was a spearman, and much the bravest of us. This was like him, too, these sort of compliments. I understood now how his treasury had come to be so full of the gifts of treaty and alliance. Among our bragging, ranting heroes, Peleus was the exception, a man of modesty. We stayed to listen as the servants added one log, then another to the flames. It was halfway to dawn before he would send us back to our beds. The only place I did not follow was to see his mother. He went late at night, or at dawn before the palace was awake, and returned flushed and smelling of the sea. When I asked about it, he told me freely, his voice strangely toneless. It is always the same. She wants to know what I am doing and if I am well. She speaks to me of my reputation among men, and at the end she asks if I will come with her. I was rapt. Where? The caves under the sea where the sea nymphs lived so deep the sun did not penetrate. Will you go? He shook his head. My father says I should not. He says no mortal who sees them comes back the same. When he turned away, I made the peasant sign against evil. Gods avert. It frightened me a little to hear him speak of a thing so calmly. Gods and mortals never mixed happily in our stories. But she was his mother, I reassured myself and he was half-god himself. In time, his visits with her were just another strangeness about him that I became accustomed to, like the marvel of his feet or the inhuman deftness of his fingers. When I heard him climbing back through the window at dawn, I would mumble from my bed, Is she well? And he would answer, Yes, she is well. And he might add, The fish are thick today, or The bay is warm as a bath. And then we would sleep again. One morning of my second spring, he came back from his visit with his mother later than usual. The sun was almost out of, uh, 
out of the water, and the goat bells were clanging in the hills. Is she well? She is well. She wants to meet with you. I felt a surge of fear, but stifled it. Do you think I should? I could not imagine what she would want with me. I knew her reputation for hating mortals. He did not meet my eyes. His fingers turned to stone he found over and over. There is no harm in it. Tomorrow night, she said. I understood now that it was a command. The gods did not make requests. I knew him well enough to see that he was embarrassed. He was never so stiff with me. Tomorrow, he nodded. I did not want him to see my fear, though normally we kept nothing from each other. Should I... should I bring a gift? Honeyed wine? We poured it over the altars of the gods in, on festival days. It was one of our richest offerings. He shook his head. She doesn't like it. The next night, when the household slept, I climbed out of our window. The moon was half full, bright enough for me to pick my way over the rocks without a torch. He had said that I was to stand in the surf and she would come. No, he had reassured me, you do not need to speak. She will know. The waves were warm and thick with sand. I shifted, watched the small white crabs run through the surf. I was listening, thinking I might hear the splash of her feet as she approached. A breeze blew down the beach and, grateful, I closed my eyes to it. When I opened them again, she was standing before me. She was taller than I was, taller than any woman I had ever seen. Her black hair was loose down her back, and her skin shone luminous and impossibly pale, as if it drank light from the moon. She was so close I could smell her, seawater laced with dark brown honey. I did not breathe. I did not dare. You are Patroclus. I flinched at the sound of her voice, hoarse and rasping. I had expected chimes, not the grinding of rocks in the surf. Yes, lady. Distaste ran over her face. Her eyes were not like a human's. They were black to their center and flecked with gold. I could not bring myself to meet them. He will be a god, she said. I did not know what to say, so I said nothing. She leaned forward, and I half thought she might touch me. But of course she did not. Do you understand? I could feel her breath on my cheek. Not warm at all, but chilled like the depths of the sea. Do you understand? He had told me that she hated to be kept waiting. Yes. She leaned closer still, looming over me. Her mouth was a gash of red, like the torn open stomach of a sacrifice, bloody and oracular. Behind it, her teeth shone sharp and white as bone. Good. Carelessly, as if to herself, she added, You will be dead soon enough. She turned and dove into the sea, leaving no ripples behind her. I did not go straight back to the palace. I could not. I went to the olive grove instead to sit among the twisting trunks and fallen fruits. It was far from the sea. I did not wish to smell the salt now. You will be dead soon enough. She had said it coldly, as a fact. She did not wish for me. Uh, she did not wish me for his companion, but I was not worth killing. To a goddess, the few decades of human life were barely even an inconvenience. And she wished him to be a god. She had spoken it so simply, as if it were obvious. A god. I could not imagine him so. Gods were cold and distant, far off as the moon, nothing like his bright eyes, the warm mischief of his smiles. Her desire was ambitious. It was a difficult thing to make even a half-god immortal. True, it had happened before to Heracles and Orpheus and Orion. They sat in the sky now, presiding as constellations, feasting with the gods on ambrosia. But these men had been the sons of Zeus, their sinews strong with the purest ichor that flowed. Thetis was a lesser of the lesser gods, a sea nymph only. In our stories, these divinities had to work by wheedling and flattery, by favors won from stronger gods. They cannot do so much themselves, except live forever. What are you thinking about? It was Achilles come to find me. 
His voice was loud in the quiet grove, but I did not startle. I had half expected him to come. I had wanted him to. Nothing, I said. It was untrue. I guess it always is. He sat down beside me, his feet bare and dusty. Did she tell you you would die soon? I turned to him, startled. Yes, I said. I'm sorry, he said. The wind blew the gray leaves above us, and somewhere I heard the soft pat of an olive fall. She wants you to be a god, I told him. I know. His face twisted with embarrassment, and in spite of itself, my heart lightened. It was such a boyish response, and so human. Parents everywhere. But the question still waited to be asked. I could do nothing until I knew the answer. Do you want to be? I paused, struggling, though I had promised myself I wouldn't. I had sat in the grove practicing this very question as I waited for him to find me. Do you want to be a god? His eyes were dark in the half-light. I could not make out the gold flecks in the green. I don't know, he said at last. I don't know what it means or how it happens. He looked down at his hands, clasping his knees. I don't want to leave here. When would it happen, anyway? Soon? I was at a loss. I knew nothing of how gods were made. I was mortal only. He was frowning now, his voice louder. And is there really a place like that? Olympus? She doesn't even know how she would do it. She pretends she knows. She thinks if I become famous enough. He trailed off. This, at least, I could follow. Then the gods will take you voluntarily? He nodded, but he had not answered my question. Achilles. He turned to me, his eyes still filled with frustration, with a sort of angry, angry bewilderment. He was barely twelve. Do you want to be a god? It was easier this time. Not yet, he said. A tightness I had not known was there eased a little. I would not lose him yet. He cupped a hand against his chin. His features looked finer than usual, like carved marble. I'd like to be a hero, though. I think I could do it. If the prophecy is true. If there's a war. My mother says I'm better even than Heracles was. I did not know what to say to this. I did not know if it was motherly bias or fact. I did not care. Not yet. He was silent a moment, then turned to me suddenly. Would you want to be a god? There, among the moss and olives, it struck me as funny. I laughed, and a moment later he did too. I do not think that is likely, I told him. I stood, put a hand down for him. He took it, pulled himself up. Our tunics were dusty, and my feet tingled slightly with the drying sea salt. There were figs in the kitchen. I saw them, he said. We were only twelve, too young to brood. I bet I can eat more than you. Race you. I laughed. We ran. Take a sip of water. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh... In this chapter, they kind of start discussing um, kind of like sexual themes. So if that's something that makes you uncomfortable, then maybe I'd click off now. Um, but I just wanted to warn you. So, chapter seven. The next summer, we turned 13. Him first, and then me. Our bodies began to stretch, pulling at our joints until they were aching and weak. In Peleus's shining bronze mirror, I almost did not recognize myself. Lanky and gaunt, stork legs and sharpening chin. Achilles was taller still, seeming to tower above me. Eventually we would be of a height, but he came to his maturity sooner, with a startling speed, primed perhaps by the divinity in his blood. The boys, too, were growing older. Regularly now, we heard moans behind closed doors and saw shadows returning to their beds before dawn. In our countries, a man often took a wife before his beard was fully fledged. How much earlier, then, did he take a serving girl? It was expected. 
Very few men came to their marriage beds without having done so. Those who did were unlucky indeed, too weak to compel, too ugly to charm, and too poor to pay. It was customary for a palace to have a full complement of nobly born women as servants for the mistress of the house. But Peleus had no wife in the palace, and so the women we saw were mostly slaves. They had been bought or taken in warfare or bred from those who were. During the day, they poured wine and scrubbed floors and kept the kitchen. At night, they belonged to soldiers or foster boys, to visiting kings or Peleus himself. The swollen bellies that followed were not a thing of shame. They were profit, more slaves. These unions were not always rape. Sometimes there was mutual satisfaction and even affection. At least, that is what the men who spoke of them believed. It would have been easy, infinitely easy, for Achilles or me to have bedded one of those girls ourselves. At thirteen, we were almost late to do so, especially him, as princes were known for their appetites. Instead, we watched in silence as the foster boys pulled girls into their laps or Peleus summoned the prettiest to his room after dinner. Once I, er Once I even heard the king offer her to his son. He answered, almost diffidently, I am tired tonight. Later, as we walked back to our room, he avoided my eyes. And I? I was shy and silent, with all but Achilles. I could scarcely speak to the other boys, let alone a girl. As a comrade of the prince, I suppose I would not have had to speak. A gesture or a look would have been enough. But such a thing did not occur to me. The feelings that had stirred at me at night seemed strangely distant from those serving girls with their lowered eyes and obedience. I watched a boy fumbling at a girl's dress, the dull look on her face as she poured his wine. I did not wish for such a thing. One night, we had stayed late in Peleus's chamber. Achilles was on the floor, an arm thrown beneath his head for a pillow. I sat more formally in a chair. It was not just because of Peleus. I did not like the sprawling length of my new limbs. The king's, the old king's eyes were half closed. He was telling us a story. Meliager was the finest warrior of his day, but also the proudest. He expected to be the best of everything, and because the people loved him, he received it. My eyes drifted to Achilles. His fingers were stirring, just barely in the air. He often did this when he was composing a new song. The story of Meliager, I guessed it, as his father told it. But one day, the king of Caledon said, Why must we give so much to Meliager? There are other worthy men in Caledon. Achilles shifted, and his tunic pulled tight across his chest. That day, I had overheard a serving girl whispering to her friend, Do you think the prince looked at me at dinner? Her tone was one of hope. Meliager heard the words of the king and was enraged. This morning, he had leapt onto my bed and pressed his nose against mine. Good morning, he'd said. I remembered the heat of him against my skin. He said, I will not fight for you any longer. And he went back to his house and sought comfort in the arms of his wife. I felt a tug on my foot. It was Achilles, grinning at me from the floor. Caledon had fierce enemies, and when they heard that Meliager would no longer fight for Caledon, I pushed my foot toward him a little, provokingly, his fingers wrapped around my ankle. They attacked, and the city of Caledon suffered terrible losses. Achilles yanked, and I slid half out of the chair. I clung to the wooden frame so I would not be pulled onto the floor. So the people went to Meliager to beg him for his help, and... Achilles, are you listening? Yes, father. You are not. You are tormenting our poor scops. I tried to look tormented but all I felt was the coolness against my ankle, where his fingers had just been a moment before. It is just as well, perhaps. I am getting tired. We will finish the story another evening. We stood and wished the old man good night, but as we turned, he said, Achilles, you might look for the light-haired girl from the kitchen. 
She has been haunting doorways for you, I hear. It was hard to know if it was the firelight that made his face look so changed. Perhaps, father, I am tired tonight. Peleus chuckled as if this were a joke. I'm sure she could wake you up, and waved us off. I had to trot a little to keep up with him as we walked back to our rooms. We washed our faces in silence, but there was an ache in me, like a rotten tooth. I could not let it be. That girl, do you like her? Achilles turned to face me from across the room. Why, do you? No, no, no I flushed. That is not what I meant. I had not felt so uncertain with him since the earliest days. I mean, do you want... He ran at me, pushed me backwards onto my cot, leaned over me. I am sick of talking about her, he said. The heat rose up my neck, wrapped fingers over my face. His hair fell around me, and I could smell nothing but him. The grain of his lips seemed to rest a hair's breadth from mine. Then, just like that morning, he was gone, up across the room and pouring a last cup of water. His face was still and calm. Good night, he said. At night, in bed, images come. They begin as dreams, trailing caresses in my sleep from which I start, trembling. I lie awake and still they come. The flicker of firelight on a neck, the curve of a hip bone drawing downwards hands smooth and strong reaching to touch me. I know those hands, but even here, behind the darkness of my eyelids, I cannot name the thing I hope for. During the days I grow restless, fidgety, but all my pacing, singing, running does not keep them at bay. They come and will not be stopped. It is summer, one of the first fine days. We are on the beach after lunch, our backs to a sloping piece of driftwood. The sun is high and the air warm around us. Beside me, Achilles shifts and his foot falls open against mine. It is cool and chafed pink from the sand, soft from a a winter indoors. He hums something, a piece of a song he had played earlier. I turn to look at him. His face is smooth without the blotches and spots that have begun to afflict the other boys. His features are drawn with a firm hand, nothing awry or sloppy. Nothing too large, all precise, cut with the sharpest of knives, and yet the effect itself is not sharp. He turns and finds me looking at him. What? he says. Nothing. I can smell him. The oils that he uses on his feet, pomegranate and sandalwood, the salt of clean sweat, the hyacinths we walked through, their scent crushed against our ankles, Beneath it all is his own smell, the one I go to sleep with, the one I wake up to. I cannot describe it. It is sweet, but not just. It is strong, but not too strong. Something like almond, but that is still not right. Sometimes, after we have wrestled, my own skin smells like it. He puts a hand down to lean against. The muscles in his arms curve softly, appearing and disappearing as he moves. His eyes are deep green on mine. My pulse jumps for no reason I can name. He has looked at me a thousand, thousand times, but there is something different in this gaze, an intensity I do not know. My mouth is dry and I can hear the sound of my throat as I swallow. He watches me. It seems that he is waiting. I shift an infinitesimal movement towards him. It is like the leap from a waterfall. I do not know until then what I am going to do. I lean forward and our lips land clumsily on each other. They are like the fat bodies of bees, soft and round and giddy with pollen. I can taste his mouth, hot and sweet with honey from from dessert. My stomach trembles and a warm drop of pleasure spreads beneath my skin. More. The strength of my desire, the speed with which it flowers, shocks me. I flinch and startle back from him. I have a moment, only a moment, to see his face framed in the afternoon light, his lips slightly parted, still half forming a kiss. His eyes are wide with surprise. I am horrified. 
what have I done? But I do not have time to apologize. He stands and steps backwards. His face has closed over, impenetrable and distant, freezing the explanations in my mouth. He turns and races, the fastest boy in the world, up the beach and away. My side is cold with his absence. My skin feels tight, and my face, I know, is red and raw as a burn. Dear gods, I think, let him not hate me. I should have known better than to call upon the gods. When I turned the corner onto the garden path, she was there, knife uh, sharp and knife bright. A blue dress clung to her skin as if damp. Her dark eyes held mine, and her fingers, chill and unearthly pale, reached for me. My feet knocked against each other as she lifted me from the earth. I have seen, she hissed, the sound of waves breaking on stone. I could not speak. She held me by the throat. He is leaving. Her eyes were black now, dark as sea-wet rocks and, uh, and as jagged. I should have sent him long ago. Do not try to follow. I could not breathe now, but I did not struggle. That much, at least, I knew. She seemed to pause, and I thought she might speak again. She did not only opened her hand and released me, boneless to the ground. A mother's wishes. In our countries, they were not worth much, but she was a goddess, first and always. When I returned to the room, it was already dark. I found Achilles sitting on his bed, staring at his feet. His head lifted, almost hopefully, as I came to the doorway. I did not speak. His mother's black eyes still burned in front of me, and the sight of his heels flashing up the beach. Forgive me, it was a mistake. This is what I might have dared to say then if it had not been for her. I came into the room, sat on my own bed. He shifted, his eyes flicking to mine. He did not resemble her the way that children normally look like a parent. A tilt of chin, the shape of an eye. It was something in his movements, in his luminous skin. Son of a goddess. What had I thought would happen? Even from where I sat, I could smell the sea on him. I'm supposed to leave tomorrow, he said. It was almost an accusation. Oh, I said. My mouth felt swollen and numb, too thick to form words. I'm going to be taught by Chiron, he paused, then added. He taught Heracles and Perseus. Not yet, he had said to me but his mother had chosen differently. He stood and pulled off his tunic. It was hot, full summer, and we were accustomed to sleeping naked. The moon shone on his belly, smooth, muscled, downed with light brown hairs that darkened as they ran below his waist. I averted my eyes. The next morning at dawn, he rose and dressed. I was awake. I had not slept. I watched him through the fringes of my eyelids, feigning sleep. From time to time, he glanced at me. In the dim half-light, his skin glowed gray and smooth as marble. He slung his bag over his shoulder and paused, a last time, at the door. I remember him there, outlined in the stone frame, his hair falling loose, still untidy from sleep. I closed my eyes, and a moment passed. When I opened them again, I was alone. Ooh, we're only at 30 minutes. Let's see how long chapter 8 is. Excuse me. Also, excuse all the noise. It is so annoying. Hmm. I think we'll stop there. Just because the next chunk is when they're with Chiron. And it's like a good section. So next time, next time we'll probably do three chapters. Um, but yeah, so that was chapter six and seven of the Song of Achilles. I hope you enjoyed it. I also wanted to tell you guys that I am considering reading out loud on my Twitch account. So I'll put the name of it in the description box. Um, I don't know when, uh, 
Um, but I want to read um, like the Hunger Games series, um, starting with the prequel that came out in 2020, The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. So I'd read that first, and then I'd read the trilogy. Um, so if that's something you'd be interested in hearing, um, please follow my Twitch account. Um, and, um, like I said, I don't know when that'll be yet, but if you want to, um, be updated about when I might stream, then, uh, maybe follow my Instagram. I usually mention there when I'm going to stream. I haven't streamed in a really long time, but I wanted to get back into it, so, yeah. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope to see you next time. Until then, bye bye